With a baseball box score, you can sort of look at uh, each player and you can look at the symbols and you can basically construct in your mind how the game went. And it's the same with each of these horses where you can look at their previous performances and you can construct in your mind how that horse ran and then you can sort of get a picture of how the horse might do in this race. Now, you can work it out perfectly on paper um, but then as far as how the horse runs, sometimes, you know, it, it'll all come down to luck, but we do the best we can to sort of predict how it'll all go. Bruce, can I embarrass you? <laughs> Everybody, this is uh, Bruce Seymour, who's the general manager of the racetrack, and any complaints that you have about me should be directed <laughs> to Bruce. <laughs> um, and I guess we have some... Uh, Greyhound hats from the Palm Beach Kennel Club, um, if, if you'd like a hat afterwards. Um, but if I could have uh, my mom and, and Lindsay come up, um, I'm going to show you all something that I made. And it's a little bit crude, but it's sort of a blow up of the program. And just to sort of run through it real quick, and then I'll turn it over to my dad. And so this is sort of the part about how to pick the horses. And then my dad will tell you about how then when the betting happens, how the money's then divided out. Um, so, so the first thing that we'll do before we get to this is, say if we look at the eighth race and we look at horse number one, you have all the horses listed out. And I always like to say that, you know, every winner can be found in the program. And, and so one of these horses has to win. So now we're going to try and find which horse is going to win. So you have nine horses in this eighth race and the very top of the page gives you the conditions of the race. So you know that the race is one mile and you see that it's going to be a full lap of the track. This is a thoroughbred claiming race. And so there are different levels of racing. And what the claiming means is that the horses can be bought here for the $10,000 price, which is next to the claiming label. The other races that you'll see today, you'll see some races that have names to them. Those are stakes races, the important races like the Kentucky Derby and the Belmont. And they're sort of uh, graded and offer the most amount of prize money. Then below that, you'll have allowance races, which are sort of condition races, races for horses who haven't won um, two races in a year, horses who haven't won uh, in, in, a, in a stakes race. And so those are condition races. Then you have claiming races, which are below that, where each of the horses are for sale. And then you also have maiden races, which are for horses who have never won a race before. And then there's some sort of combinations like a starter allowance and optional claiming. Um, but, but you know that for the eighth race, you have a $10,000 claiming race and it offers a purse of $9,000 and it's for fillies and mares, so female horses, three-year-olds and up. So now we know what race we have and now we got to find one of these fillies and mares who can win at a mile and who can win at this class level of $10,000 claiming. So for each of the nine horses, you'll have at the very top of them the name of the horse and some basic information. So you have Quietly Roar, and that's going to be horse number one. And you see up there the names of the owner, the trainer, the silks, the uniform that the jockey's going to wear so you can try and pick the horse out during the race. You have the name of the jockey. Uh, Michael Philip Imarino is aboard Quietly Roar. And underneath the name of the jockey you can see how the jockey has performed this season there are four numbers the first number is the total number of starts then the number of wins the number of second place finishes and the number of third place finishes and then the percentage is the percentage that he has finished in the money and if you look at the back of the program there's a standings you can check out later for who some of the best jockeys are and then also at this very top part is the overall performance of the horse, how he's done in his lifetime, how he's done this year, how he's done at Arapahoe Park. And this is just sort of the synopsis of the lifetime history of the horse. Um, and then underneath that, you see a bunch of lines and each of them have dates on the very left. And those are the horse's previous races and they're in reverse chronological order. And that's what I, w what I wanted to run through um, really quickly just to sort of show you what it all means and we'll basically just go from left to right so hopefully everybody can uh see this um and you can also follow along in the program but you start out with the date that the horse 
last ran, and I took this from a, a race last week, the, uh, the front range stakes with Streak and Mohican, but each of the horses in reverse chronological order, you have the date that it ran, and then you have the track that it ran at and the type of race that it, and the condition of the track. So June the 3rd, ARP, you'll see a lot that's Arapaho Park, and each racetrack has its own little abbreviation. The 9 next to ARP, it means the ninth race of the day, and the FT is the fast, is the condition of the track. It was a fast track that day. Most of the time, you'll see a fast track. Sometimes, um, if it's been raining, you'll see wet, fast, or good, or sloppy. And you'll also see sometimes, if the horses run on turf, a T with a circle on it. So this part here just tells you the date and the place that the horse ran and the condition of the track that day. And then as you progress to the right, you'll see the distance that the horse ran in. And so um, races are measured in furlongs. And a furlong is sort of a really only exists for racing today. And a furlong is an eighth of a mile. So here's 6F, 6 um, furlongs is six eighths of a mile, three quarters of a mile. And if we're looking at the eighth race, we'll see that the race is one mile. And if you start looking at Quietly Roar's past races, you'll see that her races have been a little bit shorter than a mile, five and a half furlongs, six furlongs. Whereas if you look at number two, Tea Party's success in her last race, she is a 1M. So she raced at one mile last time out, which is this distance. And so then um, after the distance, you have the final time that that horse ran. And I think this is always a good thing to look at because you can have a horse that wins and runs a time and you never know how to compare them sometimes because the track condition might be different, but you could have a horse that wins in a time that actually isn't as quick as say a time for a horse that finished in third in a fast race. And actually that was one thing that I noticed yesterday is that some of the horses that I thought would do well because they were previous winners, they were actually winning in a time that might have been a second or, or two seconds slower than a horse ran when it had finished, say, in fourth place. And at the end of the day, at the bottom line, is that the fastest horse is going to win. So after you have um, the times, then you have the type of race. And on this sort of snapshot, you have uh, the stakes race, the Arapaho Park Sprint, but as we mentioned, you have also the allowance, the claiming, and the maiden races. And so this race here is a claiming race. And next to the claiming number, or the, you, next to the claiming label, you sometimes have the, the number, um, which is the, the claiming price. So you see Quietly Roar was in a claiming race for $5,000. This is a $10,000 claiming race. So it's called stepping up in class. Whereas this horse was running in the claiming race, it would be dropping in class. And so that's another thing, in addition to the time, to look at the type of races that the horse has been running in. If it's been running against some really good horses, and now it's against a class level that's not as high, then you figure, okay, look, the competition might be a little easier. Kind of like, say, a boxer who might have been fighting for the title, and now he's sort of in a more of a, a tune-up fight. Um, so this is just all sort of uh, basic information about the race, and the real crux of the whole program, I think, comes down to this little part here. And this is the way that the horse ran. Now, the first thing you'll see is a rating, which is sort of a number that's given out um, to determine how that horse did in a, in a scale where you can look at that and you can say, this horse ran at 65, this horse ran at 85, and no matter what the distance or what type of race it is, you can compare numbers across different types of horses. The most famous rating system is the buyer speed figure, which is in the daily racing form. And in this Arapaho Park sprint, Streak and Mohican ran a 100 buyer, which is for Arapaho Park. Um, the general manager, Bill Powers, told me he'd never seen a horse run a 100 buyer at Arapaho Park. The Kentucky Derby and the Belmont, they'll usually run in the 100s, sometimes the 110s. And then, you know, for races at allowance or claiming level, you, you drop down to, say, the 80s, um, the 70s, or the 60s. So that sort of gives you a rating. And then this here is, the, is the, I think, the most important thing, and that's the running line that the horse did. The very final number is how the horse finished. So this one here means that the horse finished first, and the little superscript number is how far in front that it finished. So this horse finished first by four lengths. 
and then working this way, you see the progression that the horse did. It broke from post position six, it started um, first, it maintained its lead, and you see that its lead was a half a length, then three lengths, then five lengths, then four lengths at the finish. So you have the position is the big number, and then the superscript is either the distance ahead or the distance behind. And just from looking at this one race, you see, okay, the horse in my mind made the lead and it just kept going and it kept increasing the lead and it ended up winning. And then if you look at, say, some of the horses in the program and you look at a few of the races, you can get a pattern. You can see if a horse has been coming from behind, if a horse likes to go to the lead, and then depending upon the distance, if it's been able to handle the distance, if it's been getting tired, if it looks like it has a little more energy. So I think this is the most important thing. And this is exactly like looking at a baseball box score where you see how each batter did, how it's at bat was, and then how it progressed during the inning. Um, and, and I really can't emphasize enough how this is sort of gives you a visual for how the horse did in its previous races and gives you a chance to look at how the horse might perform in this type of race. Um, and then the last part of the program line gives you the jockey. And here we have Wales T, so Travis Wales. And sometimes uh, a thing to look at is whether a jockey stays on a horse, whether they change jockeys, whether the jockey that they change to it has a higher win percentage, whether you have a jockey who's ridden um, multiple horses in the same race in their previous races, and he maybe has the decision, you know, I could ride horse A or horse B, and I'm going to go with horse A. And that sort of gives the, the jockey's opinion potentially that, that could um, end up giving you some indication because really no one knows the horse better than their jockey and, and their trainer. So, so that it's always interesting to look at jockey changes and the like. Um, and then the final thing is you see the weight that the jockey carried, any equipment that the horse had as far as medication or blinkers. Um, and then the odds here tell you how popular the horse was on that day. And a little star will tell you that that horse was the favorite. My mom asks uh, what some of the symbols stand for. And just to run through them real quick, um, the F stands for front wraps. The L stands for Lasix. Uh, and I think one thing to look for is a little B. B stands for blinkers because that's something that seems like uh, horses like wearing the blinkers or don't like it. And then finally, you have the order that the horse is finished in the first, second, and third. And one thing to look at when you see how the top three finishers were is if any of them are in italics, that means that that horse won their next race. So if you have a horse who finished in third and the second place finisher then went on to win his next race, it shows that that was somewhat of a formful race. And then at the very end, you get a comment, um, say bumped at the start or uh, was passed at the finish, or it just gives you a little uh, sort of words to put with the numbers. And then at the very end, is the total number of horses in that race. So that was a very quick rundown on the program. Um, but as you can see, it's very complicated, um, but it's also very neat once you figure it out because you have a chance to determine how you think the horse might do in your head and give you some sort of background on what could end up happening. And just to emphasize one more time, I think the most important thing is the running line because you can sort of picture the tendencies of the horse and how the horse performed. Um, I want to make sure that my dad's able to get through the mathematics behind it. And then if you have any questions at the end, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to answer them. And also, I'll make sure to pass out some uh, cards with my email address that, that I'm always happy to, to answer any questions that you have with that. So um, I'm going to now turn it over to the feature speaker. Um, eventually, yep. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to invite um, anybody who can't see well. There's there's three four chairs over here that are wide open. The same price. Uh, um, and um, you know, feel free to sit on the floor, sit on the table here. There's plenty of there's an empty. There's a nice big one over here. And grab a donut. Grab a donut. Yeah. There's a donut at Centennial. A horse named, there's a horse named Donut somewhere. 
<laughs> there you go. Right over here. Um, there's a bunch of. And um, also, my name is David Horowitz, and um, I'm Jonathan's father. And I want to um, just start out by thanking all of you for welcoming Jonathan to the track, the horse ray. I've been to a whole slew of tracks with Jonathan over the years, and the racetrack can be a very foreboding place. A um, lot of people, a lot of money, horses, everything. And Jonathan always tells me um, how much he enjoys working here, how, many, how much he enjoys the fans and, and the horses and, and, and the management. And I want to thank each of you for welcoming him. Um, I want to talk a little bit, and it'll be very little here, on paramutual wagering. When you see those odds come up, how did it get to those odds? because those odds are constantly changing, and it's, it's somewhat of a mystery how those numbers show up on the tote board or on the screen, you know, where those things come from. You want to come? Come on right in. There's, there's place, plenty of place here. And so I used to teach mathematics, um, and I did teach a course on mathematics and gambling. Here's right over here. Here's on the table. Is it okay? Not a problem. And um, I find it fascinating to see uh, how these paramutual, paramutual odds do come up. And so I, what I've done is I've prepared for you a, uh, a two and a half hour lecture on paramutual <laughs> wagering. Um, <laughs> but um, we only have a couple of minutes here, so I'm going to try to blast through it here and uh, give you an idea of what's going on. Since I do not have a uh, overhead or a chalkboard or something, I did prepare some sort of display things, which I'll ask various people to come up and hold up here so that we can actually build an equation so that you can see how the paramutual wagering takes shape. Do you want to come in? Um, are there programs? I have to get something. I'm getting up here. Okay. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to start with Jonathan. And I've taken just some arbitrary figures for making bets, but you can easily extrapolate and see how uh, this would work in general. But I've just taken a couple of figures and a couple of uh, horses and see how things go. I think the one thing to remember is that the odds at the end of the day, when the odds that you get paid out, are based on two things, and only two things. One is how much money has been bet on that particular pool. And secondly is how much money has been bet on the winner. And everything else does not count. Those are the only things that determine your final payout. Now, obviously, you've got to pick the winner. But, uh, but the only two things are the total amount of money bet and the, uh, the amount bet on your winning horse. And the other thing to remember is that when you look at the odds, those, the odds you're seeing are the win odds, the odds for the, the winning horse. Those are completely independent of all the other pools. So there's a place pool, and the place odds are completely different, and the show odds are completely different, and the exact odds are completely different, and the quinella is completely different. Each pool has its own odds. You are only seeing the win odds when you look at the tote, but, um, but each pool has its own odds, and I'm going to look at a win pool right now. I'm not sure I'm going to have a time to do the place pool, but anyway, we'll start out. So I'm going to have Jonathan stand right over here. We're going to begin the equation. And I've hypothesized that there were 500 tickets bet to win on the race. I mean, obviously, there's more, but I just took 500. And each ticket was $2. Now, you can bet $3, $10, but I just, just to make life easy. So there's a total of 1,000. So you want to hold both of these up. So that's our first, um, that, that's what was bet to win on the race. OK, I mean, this is just. Uh, and now we're going to get the winning horse. And I think I'm going to have Lindsay come up here and do the winning horse. Um, for those who have not met Lindsay, this is Jonathan's girlfriend. And um, I'm going to have you stand sort of over here. And what I've hypothesized is that there were 44 people who bet on the winning horse. And th these are just numbers I made up. I just want to try to get numbers that, you know, show you a little something so I can, so, you know, so, I mean, obviously 500 people didn't bet on the winning horse. You know, that would be amazing. But and so they would have bet a total of $88. Okay, so those are the two numbers that really count. The, the $1,000 bet to win on all the horses and Lindsay's $88 
winning horse. So you, hold, you hold on to that, and you hold on to that, and we'll move on. So how does the track now go about paying you out? How do they pay Lindsay when, um, when she wins the race? Well, first of all, the track takes a certain percentage for its operating expenses. The track is not in business to, uh, for charity. It, it needs to run the show here. It needs to you know, water the, the plants and, uh, and buy the donuts and, and all this other thing. And so various tracks take out various amounts, and I just did a conservative 10%. So all of a sudden now, your wind pool goes down to $900, okay? And just a, a guess that I'm making, I don't know what Arapahoe takes, but, um, but I, did, um, I did $900, okay? So they, the track has $900 to pay out to Lindsay's winners. Is everybody with me so far? You sure? Okay. Okay. So first of all, everybody who bets a winning ticket has got to get at least their money back. So here's the subtraction thing. <laughs> okay, and you just stand over there. No, over there. And we'll move Lindsay next to you. And that is the amount of money available to the winners. And so here's the equality sign. And for those in the audience who did the arithmetic, the answer to this uh, is, um, what I have here? $812. Is that right? Did you get $812? <laughs> okay, so I need, uh, I guess I need, I need Miriam now to, um, to hold up the, uh, okay, so this is now winning money. Everybody's got paid back their original ticket bet. I mean, those of you who bet $5 on the winner, you got your $5 back. And now you stand next to Lindsay. Okay, so everybody got this. So we're creating an equation. Okay. So now what we need to do is we have to pay out each of your winning tickets, each of your $2 winning tickets. Okay. So, Daniel, you want to do the next? Uh, huh? Okay. Okay, Nathan's going to do the next. This is Jonathan's friend, Nathan. Okay. So what we're going to do, here's a division sign. And we're going to divide that 812 by $88. As a matter of fact, have Miriam hold the division sign. And uh, good, okay. And have you done the division yet in your head, or you haven't done uh, 8, 812 divided by 88? So I've done it for you. Here's the equal sign. Daniel, you want to come up here now? Or? And so what you get is $9.22 for every dollar that was bet. Okay? So every dollar, every, I'm sorry, every winning dollar is worth now $9.22. Okay? Now at this point, something interesting comes into play. This is what's called breakage. The track doesn't want to deal in pennies. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even want to deal in nickels. It only wants to deal in dimes. When you go up to the window, you get dimes back, right? You never get pennies, pennies back. And so the track truncates the 922. And now this is not rounding. This is actually truncating down to the nearest dime. Do you follow what I'm saying? So the 922 becomes $9.20. So, so the question is, you know, what happened to the two cents? Well, inflation, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, it's uh, no, the, the track keeps the breakage. So even if Daniel had been holding $9.29, it would not go up to $9.30. It would go down to $9.20. It's, it's, trunc it's truncating. It's not rounding. Okay. So at this point, we need another volunteer. You willing? <laughs> You're not thinking. You're doing better than all these guys. Very good. Okay. Okay. So what is your name? Cheryl. Thank Cheryl. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. So what we've got to do now is we have to pay out $9.20 for every dollar that was bet. So what we're going to do, you stand next to Daniel. So for every, so on a $2 ticket, you're going to multiply the $9.20 by $2. That's going to give you uh, 1840 And then you're going to get your original $2 back, right? I mean, you've got to pay your $2 back. And so the winning ticket, the $2 winning ticket is now worth $20.40. And that's what happens when you go to the, uh, to the window. Do you want me to do the, uh, is there time to do the, the place pool or not really? You want me to run through the place pool? Okay, so you guys can't go away. Okay. Let me see. 
they do. So I'm gonna. So this is the win pool. Last place betting. You stay. Yeah. Nobody can move. Can you collect? No, no, no. Those are those are there. You gotta know. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I, I didn't think there was a last place wager. If you're interested in last place wager, you can read Jonathan's tip sheet and see. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we are going to do the place pool. Okay, and I'll, I'll try to run through this quick because I know you want to get rolling here and have lunch and everything. But uh, the place pool is independent of the wind pool completely. And in the place pool, there are two horses that are going to pay off because the first and the second horse, no matter when they ca where they come in, they are going to pay off. Okay, so this thing has got to be altered a bit with the place pool. Okay. And so for the place pool, I've sort of, I guess we need another volunteer. We, no, huh? Will you do it? Please. Okay, so we're going to do this real quick. Okay, let's see if I can do the place pool. So these are the two place horses. What is your name? Jordan. Jordan, thank you so much. Stand over here and try not to let me trip you or anything, <laughs> okay? Okay, so you hold this up for the crowd. Turn around. And these are, there's a... Show everybody. There's a red horse and a. Let's actually show the camera. There is right the camera. There's a red horse and a blue horse, and those are the two top two horses. No matter which order that they come in, those are the top two horses. And just to make life easier, I had hypothesized that there were 33 red horse tickets at two dollars a piece and 11 blue horse. Okay. So just to make make life easier. So when this thing comes together, a total of $66 and $22, here I'll take this one from you and give you this, were bet on winning place bets, okay? 66 and 22, I think everybody got that. So one horse, the red horse had $66 to place and the other one had $22 to place. So that has got, that makes a total of $88. And I, I kind of plan it this way so we wouldn't be all over the board here, okay? So you're going to go in and, let me see, where am I going to put you? Um, so we've got $88, we're bet, divided by eight. Hold on a second. No. You're, huh? Yeah, I guess you could switch with Lindsay. Yeah, you could switch with Lindsay. So Lindsay will go out and you'll come in, Jordan, okay? So we're subtracting the $88, excuse me, and now we're back to $812 to pay out the place bets, okay? And I made it this way so I wouldn't have to go start re recomputing stuff and stuff like that, okay? Now at this point, things, this is where things get interesting because the 812 has got to be divided between two horses, right? They're, the place is two horses. So the 812, don't go away, and I didn't, I should have made another thing, but this actually gets divided in half. Oh, between the two horses. No, between the two place bets. So I really, I should have one that says 406 and 406. And if we're, you were betting the trifecta, it would be divided into thirds. I, I, I mean, in the show, in show, you'd be dividing into thirds, but the place pool is now gets divided in half 406 and 406. Now, each of those $406 has got to be divided now this, it splits into two pieces. $406 has got to be divided by $66 and $22. You follow? Because this pool is split into half. So if you've got the red horse, you're in the top pool, the red, the red one. And if you've got the blue horse, you're in the bottom pool. So now things, there, there's, now we've got two separate payouts, one for each horse. Okay? Are you with me with this? Is this getting harder? Is it? Okay. So when they divide it in half, Daniel... This is now the payout per dollar for each horse. The red horse gets six dollars, I'm sorry, and 15 cents, and the blue, do blue horse gets 18 dollars and 45 cents. Not too many people thought the blue horse was going to place. Okay, and remember, this is completely different from the wind pool, completely different. So when we do the division, Daniel, here is the breakage. 
the breakage from 615 goes down to 610. And what was the other? I don't know. It goes down to 1845. 1845 go down to 1840. You see, there's no rounding here. This is a truncating. There's a lot of money that's being taken out of the pool here. Okay. And so now we are going to multiply each of these amounts by the $2 ticket that was bet. And then we're going to add in the $2. And so this is the amount that each of those tickets, each of those um, place bets would pay off. The red horse would pay off $14.20 for a $2 ticket, and the blue horse $38.80. And this is very interesting, because if you remember, the payout for the, uh, for the wind pool was, what, $9 and change or something? And here. I mean, here you've got uh, you've got it completely different. You're, what, no, it was what twenty dollars and something. So here is a place bet paying out more than the win bet, which is possible because it's a completely separate pool. It's a completely separate pool when you make the place bet. Anyway, there is a test on this coming up a little bit later after uh, after the at the end of the. If you stick around, we're going to give you a test. But uh, again, thank you for wake welcoming my family and uh, us to Arapahoe Park. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'll tell you one last interesting thing that sometimes comes up is the track is required to pay back a minimum amount. Say you have a horse that's so popular that it gets nearly all the money bet on it to win or to place or to show. And when you do the computation that my dad just did, you actually maybe get $2.05. And so, you know, you cut it down and now you're at two dollars and so all of a sudden you made a two dollar bet and you're going to get two dollars back well that would not be a very smart bet because you're all you're doing is betting to get your money back the track is actually required to pay back a certain percentage um at a lot of tracks where they go down to uh using nickels they'll pay back at five percent so you'll get two dollars and ten cents at arapo park where they only use dimes you'll get two dollars and twenty cents so Arapahoe Park has to pay a minimum of 10%. So sometimes you can have where the track would be at a liability if a horse won, because when you did the computation, the winning um, people should actually get their money back or even get a negative pool. And so in the end, the track will have to kick in a little bit to make back the minimum. And there's a term for people who make huge bets on popular horses just to get that minimum 10% or the minimum 5% back. And you'll sometimes see at the very last minute, someone might put in you know, a $10,000 bet or a $100,000 bet. And those people are called bridge jumpers because if the horse wins, they get a very quick 10% or 5% return on their money in a matter of maybe two or three minutes. If the horse loses, then that's where you get the term bridge jumpers. Um, are there any questions that I can answer? Because uh, I know this was a lot of information to give out in a short amount of time because it's something that when my father taught his probability and statistics course, it went out over a, a whole semester. Um, so this was a, a really condensed uh, amount of time. And, and, and I hope that you took something away from it.